Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort, so you can feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about the law of attraction for relationships. My guest Juliana's husband left her, and she didn't think he was going to come back. The more effort she made to fix her marriage, the more her husband just ignored her. Sometimes he would respond with hurtful retorts. But today, she feels like she's living a dream, an amazing, more loving, and more joyful dream with her man. She's going to share exactly what she did to make that happen so you can do it too. And then I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which one student picked up at marriage counseling but found utterly discouraging and unhelpful. All that is coming up, but first let's talk about the law of attraction for relationships and how you can use it to create the kind of relationship you want. What you focus on increases. That's the law of attraction at its core. And my experience in my relationship too. And it's what I witness with my clients. When I repeatedly suggested my husband ask for a raise at work, what I was really saying was, you don't make enough money. Eventually, he stopped making money altogether. That's how good I am at manifesting what I focus on. You could say that was his decision and I just happened to be married to him. But when I changed it up to start focusing and talking about how he was a good provider, he started a very successful business that he had for decades. I've been calling him Mr. Moneybags ever since. That doesn't seem like a stretch at all now, but it sure did at first. It didn't take long for him to live up to my spouse fulfilling prophecy. I call it an SFP. I created my spouse fulfilling prophecy because I decided to focus on what I wanted instead of what I didn't want. I'm just one example. I see women create the kind of relationship they dream about all the time by focusing on what they want instead of what they don't want. But what about the other person's decisions, you might wonder? Don't they get a say about what's going to happen too? Of course they do. But you have more influence than you might realize. In fact, you hold the key to how your husband or boyfriend will respond to you. Here are the steps to using the law of attraction to create what you want to experience in your love life. Number one. Find your complaint. Every unhappy student I've ever worked with had a complaint about her man, like he's controlling or narcissistic or a drunk or forever preoccupied. All of those situations are disappointing and hurtful. That's not what you sign up for when you get married. Nobody should have to feel needled, insulted, abandoned, ignored. That's awful. And when you're in it, the situation is just how it is. That's the reality, or so it seems. But what if you're actually creating the reality by focusing on it? Because that's what I did before I learned about the law of attraction for relationships and the specific ways I could apply it in my marriage, which I'm going to share with you momentarily. The good news is that whatever your pain points are in your marriage, They're exactly what you need to get started with changing it up completely and transforming your relationship into a romantic comedy. And one way to know exactly what you've been focused on is to look around at everything in your life. You've been attracting and creating everything you're experiencing right now, even though it seems very much like things are just happening to you because of someone else's actions. You get the credit and you get the responsibility for what you've created so far. And one way to suss out what you've been focused on is to write down your biggest complaint. Maybe it's that he never wants to spend time with you or he's grumpy all the time. Maybe he cares more about everybody else than he does about you. Maybe he's betrayed you. Whatever you're having the most pain around, that's where you want to start. Number two, flip your complaint upside down. Under every complaint is a hidden desire. What's yours? What's your desire? Is it that he would want to spend as much time with you as possible? Is it that he'd be in a better mood? Is it that you'd feel like the most important person in the world to him? Complaining is the lazy way to express your desire. 
Find your desire by putting it in the positive and then write it down. So if you've done steps one and two, you have written down both a complaint and a corresponding hidden desire. So mine might look like this from the old days. Complaint. He doesn't make enough money. Desire. He's a good provider. He's Mr. Moneybags. Careful that you don't put it in the negative, as in uh, for him to stop earning so little money, right? That's just the complaint restated. And that's going to have you attracting more of the same, so little money. You'll know you've arrived at a pure desire when you read what you've written and you feel happy thinking about having exactly that. Number three, start saying the desire or the spouse fulfilling prophecy out loud to yourself and others, including your man. If you're in a relationship and wanting to have a more gratifying experience, you'll want to repeat your spouse fulfilling prophecy as much as possible until it sounds normal and natural to you. It's going to feel funny when you first say it. That's a good sign. That actually means you're uncomfortable because you're making a change. You know what? Things have to change if they're going to improve. I know I've always wanted things to just get better without changing, but it can't be done. One student, Patricia, was unwittingly using the law of attraction to create distance in her marriage by repeating the mantra, you never want to spend time with me. She'd focus on all the times her husband chose to do something other than spend time with her. And and there were plenty of times. And she was hurt and angry every time. And she couldn't understand why he would be so neglectful and so callous. She was convinced that she'd married the wrong guy and that he was just immature and selfish. And when we spoke about it, Patricia began to see that she may have been contributing to the problem by affirming it with her spouse fulfilling prophecy and, and gathering evidence for her belief, even though it wasn't serving her at all. So she decided her new spouse fulfilling prophecy would be, I know you want to spend time with me. I know you want to spend time with me. So the next Saturday, she was looking forward to spending the day with her husband when her husband accepted an invite from a friend to go mountain biking that day instead. And Patricia responded out of habit with her old mantra, you never want to spend time with me. And she left the room in a huff. But a few minutes later, Patricia remembered that she was still creating the kind of relationship she didn't want instead of the kind that she did. And she went back to talk to her husband and said, I'm sorry, I got upset. I know you want to spend time with me. I'm sure you'll figure it out. It felt like a crazy thing to say. She wondered if he would question her because it felt like such a departure from reality, at least the one she'd been focused on so far, right? So she was shocked when a few minutes later, her husband said that he had called his friend to tell him he couldn't go mountain biking after all. I told him I wanted to spend the day with you. I had no idea it would work so fast, Patricia admitted, but I'm happy that it did. Focusing on what you want instead of what you don't want may take a little getting used to for you. It did for me, but having the relationship you crave, you know, the kind that's exhilarating and vibrant and confident and shiny and amazing is so worth the effort. If you find yourself thinking it would never work in your situation because your relationship is so difficult or broken or troubled, consider changing that with a spouse fulfilling prophecy. What will your new spouse fulfilling prophecy be? Pretty soon, that will be your reality. Something big is happening on the Laura Doyle campus and you're invited. Last summer, I hosted a free five-day Adored Wife Challenge and thousands of women joined to take the practical steps to fix their broken relationships from affairs, abuse, neglect, and abandonment. And even I was amazed at the astounding results they got. We're about to start the Get Respect, Reconnect, and Rev Up Your Love Life in 2021 Challenge on January 4th, where I'll share all my best stuff for free. Register at lauradoyle.org slash challenge now so you don't miss any of the action because this only happens twice a year. Register at lauradoyle.org slash challenge. I'll see you there. 
My guest Juliana's husband left her and she didn't think he was going to come back. The more effort she made to fix her marriage, the more her husband just ignored her. Sometimes he would respond with hurtful comments. But today, she feels like she's living a dream, an amazing, more loving, and more joyful dream with her man. She's going to share exactly what she did to make that happen so you can do it too. Juliana, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much. Hi, for Laura. Today. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> bet. So I'm excited to hear the whole story, but take us back to, to the bad old days. What was it like? Um, well, I'm going to take you back to the beginning, I think, because that will give a better uh, uh, frame of mind. Um, I had met my husband almost eight years ago. I used to work at a farmer's market selling soap. And before that, I was in a very long-term relationship with the father of my children. And he constantly cheated on me, lied, would leave when everything got difficult. And I finally left him. And I remember telling my mom, I had to move in with my parents. And I told my mom, I said, I never want to get married. I never want to be with anyone else. I'm done. I'm just going to live a single life and raise my daughters. And that's it. And I remember her telling me, pray, you know, just pray, pray this prayer and pray for a husband. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll pray, but I don't know what that's going to do. And I had this dream about my mom and my mom was a seamstress and she was sewing something on this beautiful navy blue dress for me and she was crying and in the dream there was a man taking me to meet my husband and I said what's his name and he said his name's Michael and I woke up and I said what the heck well two days later I was at the farmer's market working and my friend said look up and I looked up and this man came with his daughters to buy some soap that I made and I just thought I know him from somewhere and he bought the soap and, you know, he left. And I told my friend, I said, I know that man from somewhere. And she said, well, met him? I said, no. So about a month later, I'm working again. And um, I, she said, hey, there's that guy. And I looked and I said, I know that guy. And he came right over and we ended up talking for about an hour. And at the end of the conversation, I still didn't know his name. At the end of the conversation, he said, by the way, what's your name? And I said, Juliana. And I said, what's yours? And he said, Mike. And I said, oh my gosh. And I went home and I told my mom, I said, I met the man I'm going to marry one day. And she said, what? And she goes, what's his name? And I said, his name's Mike. But that dream I had, his name was Michael. And I know that's him. And I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know his last name. I never saw him after that again. And one day he contacted me out of the blue a few months after that and um, we started talking and we got to know each other and um, we dated for a little while but I think we're just in different um, spaces in our lives and so we remained really good friends and it wasn't until something had happened um, in my family and I had to leave I had to take my daughters and leave my parents house that day and I called Michael and he said bring them over and <laughs> Sorry. He he rescued us, I mean, from that situation. And just a little background on my husband. He is ex-military, very intelligent man. I mean, I've met a lot of men in my life, um, know a lot of people, and he really is the smartest man I know just a very intelligent man and just the kindest and so we left and he uh, let us stay with him for a little while until I got on my feet found my own place and we stayed friends and on and off um, you know for the next six years and then finally two years ago he called me and it was something I just knew what that phone call was and he said hey let's get married <laughs> And I just said, okay. <laughs> so we went a few weeks later and down to the courthouse and the dress I wore was a navy blue dress. Beautiful 1940s original, just beautiful dress. And I remember he asked me after, he said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel like the luckiest woman in the world. <laughs> so um, that's what happened. We got married. 
And I, after a few months, we thought, okay, you know what, what should we do? And I said, maybe you should move into my house. I owned my home. I had my daughters there. He had his youngest daughter, who was an adult, still living with him. And he said, okay, so financially it made sense. Um, and he moved in a couple months after. And I think that's when the issues really started because I started digging for pain. My mom was also dying at that time. She ended up dying a few months after we got married. Um, my oldest left home because she didn't like the new structure. She didn't like the rules. I mean, it was just everything felt like it was falling apart. And then that was the first time I remember him ever criticizing me. And I was like, what? Like telling me about the home and how I should fix this or how I should do that. And I just wasn't used to that, I guess, because I had never heard one criticism out of his mouth all those years. And I was used to being on my own and immediately it brought me back to those days when I was with my ex and he would put me down and criticize me. And I was so used to being on my own that when things like that happened, I would just leave. I'd get up and leave. And, you know, I'm going to go and I would say, you want to go for a walk by the lake, whatever. No. Okay. Well, I'm going. And I would just leave for hours or I'm going to the store and I'd be gone for hours. And I, I can only imagine how he must have felt. At that time, I thought I was justified, but I can only imagine how he felt. Um, this was his second marriage. He was married before almost 20 years, and his ex-wife cheated on him. And he had tried to make it work and did the whole marriage counseling with her, and that didn't work out. Um, so he did not need to get married again. His kids were grown, and now he came in to come and help me with my kids who were still um, half of them teenagers, the other half, you know, preteens. And I think it was a lot, a lot going on, a lot going on at that time. There was things that, you know, I started looking, you know, through his Facebook and Instagram and, you know, who's this girl and who's that? And how long were you talking to this girl before me? And, um, you know, and there was, at the time, I didn't see it, but there was so much evidence that he loved me and that he wanted to be with me. But all I could focus on was what he did before me. And why'd you marry me? Was it financially, you know, going to fit for you? Is that why you wanted to, you know, have a tax write off? I said some really horrible things. Um, and I'm sorry. I just always saw something that he did wrong that he was the problem I was fine and I even started going to counseling for depression um for I was going through uh, you know symptoms from peri you know premenopausal and I also have lupus so I mean there's just a ton of things and it just really came crashing down that first year of marriage and I just thought this was a mistake I made a huge mistake I was fine being single we were fine with our friends are you know being friends with each other and I ruined a really good thing now and you know I started thinking this is why his ex-wife <laughs> cheated on him you know it's some really horrible thoughts and really thinking this is his problem this is his problem he suffers from depression he suffers from PTSD it's his problem not mine even mm -hmm. the counselor I went to um, who was treating me for my depression said well you were fine before you got married the problem is with him and I just thought, okay, even though I think you're right, I don't like what you're saying. So I <laughs> stopped going to him. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I agree with you. And that's, yeah, that's not helping me solve my problem. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. So, you know, we, we dragged on and it was like this slow, painful, painful death until. This past um, April, right at the um, beginning of April, um, he said, I need to go stay. We live in the mountains, so it snowed. And he had he had been trying for many years to get a supervisor position um, with his job and had always given it up in order to accommodate his kid's schedule. And he's now at a time in his life when he's like, this is what I really want. 
I want to do this and nothing's going to stop me. So if it snows, you know, he was staying in hotels down the mountain that way he wouldn't miss work. And so he, I knew he was leaving. He said, I'm going to, he goes, I'm, I'm going to go. But this time he, when he said it, he goes, I'll see you when I see you. And I'm just kind of like, looked at him like, huh? Like, okay. And I was like, whatever. And he left. And after about two weeks, he called me and I just knew, I knew what the phone call was. And he said, you know, I'm not going to come back. He goes, I'm going to just stay down here in my trailer. And I just thought, okay. And I said, well, whatever. And he said, well, he started asking me questions about what I wanted to do and what about this arrangement? And I said, I don't know. I still remember I said, I said, I was so mad. And I said, I don't know. I said, you've had obviously months to think about this and I'm just finding out right now. So I'll talk to you later. And I just hung up the phone. I was, <laughs> I was upset. <laughs> and I remember thinking, um, you know, the next day, just being really, really angry. And just like, how dare he do this? He came into my life and just turned it completely upside down. My oldest left. I have two teenagers who are completely rebelling. You know, I don't talk to half my family because they can't, they don't like him um, because he's a different faith um, than what I was raised. Um, I mean, just, it, it was just a mess. And I just thought, this is crazy. Like, what am I doing? And I could be dating and he's probably dating. He's probably off, you know, doing this because I, oh, that was another thing. I was using his laptop for work and this notification comes in saying, you know, someone viewed your dating site. So I just thought, mm -hmm. you know what, this is crazy. And before he left, he had been spending more time with his ex-wife and he came to me and said something about like, and she said, oh, um, you know, how she was just made a comment about how good he was and how he would never leave and this and that. I just put him on a pedestal. And I just remember thinking, like, it was like a dagger to my heart. Just like, how could you put this woman on a pedestal and tell me as if I'm supposed to compare to her? Mm -hmm. So that made me feel even lower than, than dirt. <laughs> and so after he left, I just thought, you know, I'm going to start dating again. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to deal with this. I cannot deal with this, but in the back of my mind, I just thought I can't, like I'm married to this man and I know it's going to bother me if I go on a date with somebody, it's going to really bother me a lot. And I just remember thinking like, oh, this is not fair. <laughs> He's out there doing this and I'm over here with these kids and he's living the single life. And I remembered the kids had left to school or something. And I just screamed like, God help me, like help me to love this man. And I looked, I remember after that, I just was in tears and I was crying and I, looked at my phone and typed in how to save your marriage and your name came up. I mean, I've been looking on ways to save marriage for months and months and nothing, nothing, nothing. But that moment, that's what I needed to see. And that's what came up. And I read it and I thought, okay, the 14 steps. And I thought, okay, well, we'll see. We'll see. So I ordered um, the surrendered wife and read that and I thought oh my gosh oh my gosh like she <laughs> she had to have been looking at our home there's and I felt so horrible because there was so much in there um I had no idea how disrespectful I was being and he would tell me like you have no idea how disrespectful you are and I just thought like I'm trying to help you like I'm telling you you're doing this to because I want you to change to help our marriage <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to tell you, um, don't spend money on this, or this is how you should pay the bills, or why isn't this bill paid, or why do we have to do this? And the whole time he's asking me for a truck, he's saying, you know, can we, you know, I'd really like to get a truck, which I didn't tell you guys, he gave up his truck. He gave up his truck. He gave up all kinds of stuff in order to marry me mm -hmm. and take care of my kids. And I was there telling him, like, no, 
not right now can you wait and the final straw I remember him saying like can we get a boat and I said no and and instead you know I used the money to buy a new washing washer and dryer because they ended up breaking like that day but I bought like these really expensive ones ones that I always wanted and I was like no this is what I've always wanted and I'm not gonna have this and this whole time it was like I just steamrolled over this man so he I started reading the book and I I saw a lot of myself in it and I started um first apologizing to him sending it through text message because we didn't really talk on the phone and sometimes he would answer back sometimes it was just like okay or he wouldn't um and a lot of thank yous you know gratitudes you know thank you for this thank you for for doing this for me and that and bringing up old memories were you know times when I didn't realize how hard it was um you know for him to fix something and then I had to fix it on my own and I was like oh my gosh this is really crappy and here I and and he did this and I remember when he fixed this and he was tired and it was after work and he was hungry and he didn't complain um things like that and did that back and forth back and forth and I remember um I thought I, I need to get out of here I did feel like we're in a stalemate he's living on his own I'm up here with the kids and so I thought I'm gonna plan my my annual trip to Texas to go see my brother and sister-in-law and I I had called him to let him know and I said oh, yeah I'm on my way to Texas and you know give him the information and he said hey just to let you know I got an apartment and I'm moving in and you know it was like a few weeks or a month and I just my heart just broke and I thought he's really not coming back <laughs> like he's getting an apartment which means he signed a lease and I just said that's great <laughs> like as happy as I could possibly say it. like that's great and let me know if you need help and I remember as soon as we hung up I just bawled my eyes out and just cried and I was so sad and that's when I got the email when I got to Texas I saw about the ridiculously happy wives program and I talked to my sister-in-law and she said you know what she goes I I've noticed changes in you which I was like whoa like okay she goes I've seen good changes in you so far and she thought if that's just from the book she goes I think you should give it a shot and I said well it says give it 90 days you know and that's usually what most people see you know really significant change and she goes well just do it and first I kind of just sat on it and then I thought you know what I I spend I I mean I have like three cars and I'm not trying to brag but I'm just saying I spend a lot of money on things that aren't going to last and I thought what is I want my marriage to last like this is the man I prayed for <laughs> and like what am I doing like so I thought okay I'm gonna I'm gonna do this so I joined the program and started doing the the coaching calls and really it opened my eyes um more and more on what I was uh seeing and what I was not seeing and you know I realized like I never listened to him and I still have problems now to this day still listening to him um but I was so disrespectful and I I didn't realize that you know just how prideful and how ugly that appears to men and him being ex-military you know his natural instinct is to protect and is to defend and when I am prideful that's um I'm putting up my own defenses and that's me you know with basically a sword in front of him and so now he feels like he has to fight against this enemy and I didn't realize that by listening to him and being humble and um, duct taping, which is huge, um, was the same as me just laying down that sword. And he can get behind that every day and defend that. He can, and, and, and it wasn't until I started seeing the skills and actually working with the coaches when I started seeing um, changes in our marriage.
there is a lot. I think the most important thing is is uh, self care. That was one thing I was not happy. I was not a happy woman. And I was constantly looking around to see how everyone else can make me happy instead of looking at myself and seeing what I needed uh, to change. And I think the world, you know, tells women, especially women, like, you know, you're, you're perfect. You don't need to change. And if somebody doesn't love you, then screw them and, and, and they can move on and you need someone who's going to accept you for who you are. And, that's that is a lie that's such a lie because just because you are who you are does not mean that you can't be better and by self improving by improving yourself and noticing like i I, i'm really a selfish person i'm prideful i'm argumentative you know did i say that right argumentative (laughs) um i you know i don't listen i i am envious um I can be rude. I can, you know, all noticing those things and changing that is not um, discounting who you are as a person. That doesn't change who you are. You're not those things. You are who you are, but you have flaws and there is nothing wrong with noticing those and improving on those. And I noticed that when I started doing that, that's when he changed. Because at first, I'm not going to lie, I did the program because I thought I'm going to save my marriage. I'm going to get him back. And that's, and I kept running into stalemate, stalemate. Why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? And it was that part in the empowered wife. I had ordered that in um, getting off the fence. And I was, I thought, how am I going to save my marriage? He's not here. He's not here looking at me. He's not here. And I thought, what am I doing right now to save my marriage, even though he can't see me? Well, for one, put my wedding ring back on. You know, when I would get mad at him, I would take it off. And I know that had to hurt him. And I just thought, I'm going to wear my ring. Um, second, stop thinking about dating other guys. <laughs> You know, stop thinking in my mind like this could be easier with somebody else because you know what? No matter who you meet, they're going to have some type of flaw. And if you keep on stopping yourself and saying, oh, it's because they did this that I can't be this way. First of all, you're giving up your power. And second, that does that says a lot about you. Like it's saying that your love is conditional. And, you know, as a Christian we read about love, how it's, you know, it's patient and it's kind. And I started reading those verses and putting my name in it. I'm not those things. I'm not close to those things. And people might say, well, your husband, he put this act on when he met you. And that's not true because I, and I've noticed that people say like, well, that was an act. Nobody is that good of an actor unless you've got a coach standing over you. And, uh, and that was not an act. What I got to see was him at his best. And so that's what motivated me too. I knew like, this is, this is what he's capable of being. Maybe if I change and I change some of these things, he's going to respond a little bit different. And it is true. He did respond differently. He did. He responded a lot differently. And I noticed what happened. The biggest part for me was control. He said he needed to come pick up his TV from my house to put in his new apartment. And he said, can I come pick it up? And I said, oh, well, and I started thinking in my mind, well, I'll make him wait a few days because not today, because if I tell him he can come today, that leaves his whole weekend open. So he might go out (laughs) instead of being up here. So I said, no, wait until Saturday. And I thought, what am I doing? Here I am again going through the program and I'm still controlling so I called him up and I said I'm sorry I told you to wait until Saturday you can come pick up your tv anytime you want and he yelled at me he was like gosh darn I could have went this morning and now it messes up my day and I messed and I just listened and I duct tape and I said I just want to apologize for that that was controlling on my part and I was disrespectful so he came by Saturday and picked up his tv and I sat there 
normally I would have been like, do you need help? Do you need this? Do you need, <laughs> and I just sat there and I, that was the hardest thing I had to do because I wanted so badly to jump up and help this man <laughs> who is much stronger than me, who is honestly more, much more smarter. That's not even correct grammar, but much smarter than I am. Um, he's just, <laughs> and I'm going to try to help him. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I just sat there and he got the TV, did everything himself and left and I cried. And then I said, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm done crying. I'm going out to dinner. I'm just going to go have fun and took the girls out and my daughter's out. And he called later that night and said, you know, is it okay if I uh, pick up the girls, you know, keep them for a few weeks, you know, at his new place. And I said, oh, that's great. And I noticed there was a change in his, his voice, though. There was something different. And he sent me a link to a stand to use for my TV to replace. And I thought, there's evidence here. And that's the thing is finding the evidence. Finding the evidence. And, and, and when you are happy and you're taking care of yourself, look for the evidence. Because if you're so fixated on the one or two things that they're doing, it just ruins everything and there's so much evidence around and I mean I, it, he was still continuing to pay my health insurance my other daughter's health insurance all five of our my girls health insurance um the car insurance uh my cell phone plan everything and you know I would say okay here's my part and but he never before when we first separated he was like okay you need to get your own plan you need to get your and he stopped saying that and would just pay it and, you know, things like that, offering to watch the girls so I can still go to work because now everything's shut down from COVID. Um, but right after he got his place, my uncle, who I was really close with, um, had an emergency, ended up going to ICU. And I called him and let him know. And I said, I just, uh, and I was watching my uncle, my uncle's girlfriend was in, staying with me from the Philippines. So she'd never been to America. And I said, you know, I want to take her to Vegas and take her to different places. He said, let's go. And I just thought, like, what? Like, me, you go? <laughs> I said, why? And he's like, well, I'm taking off for vacation this weekend. Let's go. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Like, I cannot ruin this for anything. <laughs> so we left and went to Vegas. And I think that's when he was able to start seeing the changes. And um, right after that, asked me again you know, let's go to Arizona this next week and just me and him this time. And we went and he would ask questions about the program. Like, so what is this? What is this year in? What is this? Because I, I told him I was going through coaching and I didn't want to give too many details because you say not to tell them. And I um, slowly let him, you know, know about it. And I said, I want to do this for myself. I like who I'm becoming. I, I love this woman I'm becoming. And now I'm happy. I am able to be happy. And for me, that's a huge deal because for the last year, I was not happy after losing my mom and my daughters ended up leaving the house because they just got into a lot of trouble, but they didn't want to follow any of the rules anymore. Um, that was hard. And then losing my husband. And so I was just not a happy woman and being able to find joy. In, in all the little things, being able to look and, and, and pull joy from those and, and really know that I got to take care of myself. And that enabled me to be a good woman to him. And he loved that. And they're drawn to that. I can't even explain how much they're drawn to that. And I think women have it so confused because they think it's about this outer beauty, which I mean, it's not, don't get me wrong, you want to put some makeup on and fix your hair, but there's this beauty and from a quiet spirit, from kindness and from having humility, just being that cushion for their roughness. And it, it honestly, it's been amazing. And, and it has not been perfect. We've been going up and down. It's like, um, I think someone had given the tidal wave where it's like a wave comes in and then it pulls back out and it comes back. And it's like that, but more and more where it's more consistent. And so fast forward and he, took me shopping, uh, meeting up for, for my work schedule. He watched the, so yeah, so he called me and said, um, 
I'm going to be working this schedule. Why don't you bring the kids over here? And you cut back your hours, which was a dream of mine. I've always said I wanted to be a stay at home mom. And he, I gave him every excuse in the book not to. I was like, well, what about this? And what about that? And he's like, it's fine. And he's just like shooting every single thing down. And I said, okay. <laughs> so started bringing the girls over there. Well, that did um, cut into his self-care and to mine. So I noticed we were going backwards a little bit. And still, I was like, I got to pull from the skills. Still, still trying to pull, you know, what you've learned and know that clean up your side of the street. So it did become a little bit more difficult. But um, just a couple weeks ago, he told me, um, he said, I, there's a position opening up for graveyard. And I just thought, oh, Lord, it's not good. <laughs> He's going to be working overnight. He's not going to be getting any sleep now. And this man gets really grouchy when he doesn't sleep. I mean, we all do, I think. And uh, he said, you know, um, when I take that position, he goes, maybe you should just not work and just stay home with the kids, like with him in his apartment. Yes. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> So before I was so attached to my home and I, he goes, what are your goals? What is it you want to do? Um, and I said, I would love to be married to you. I would love to have a marriage and I would love to move to Arizona and I would love to have a simple life. Just you, me and the girls. And he said, okay. He goes, well, you need to sell your house. And he's telling me the list of what I need to do. And I said, okay, which a year ago I would have been like, there's no way I'm selling my house. This is my first house. And I bought this on my own. And now it's like, you know what? That doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. And it's been amazing. And it's a different type of love than what we had before. This one, actually, I feel more intimate with him. Um, and that's big because before, I mean, I could barely get the man to to even sleep with me because he was I was like why don't you want to sleep with me like that's what married people do <laughs> and he I could not understand that he is the type of man where he doesn't care if you are ugly on the inside there it just shuts everything down and that's the thing and, and for me that's a huge thing because I I'm not gonna lie I have a huge attitude problem and I don't know if that's just my background I mix with all kinds of <laughs> different things <laughs> that don't go in my favor <laughs> so you know there's a lot of attitude that runs in my family and when we speak we do this head shaking thing in hands and loudness and it's such a turn off to him even facial expressions and eyes and and, and that's something I still need to work on because I never realized how much of a put off it was to him and how disrespectful it is to him. And uh, they don't teach you that. And that's the thing. I think a lot of women, uh, I think they'll have a lot more success if they really, really look at themselves and say, what is it I need to change? And it never does stop. I mean, even to this day, I'm still like, oh my gosh, like I just realized this and you know, I had the hugest complaint about him saying, like, I would say, why are you commenting this on so-and-so's photo? Or why does she keep on liking your posts on Facebook or Instagram or whatever? Um, he ended up taking me off of that. <laughs> Probably because I was giving him so much um, nonsense about it. But, you know, I looked at my own and I had, there was this guy and we're just friends, nothing. I've never felt anything. Guys married and nothing like that and he likes every single photo I have and hearts and, and this and that and I never thought about it until like I was like I you know I kind of took like a social media break and I started thinking like what if this is how my husband's been feeling and this whole time I've been just like nah like you know don't uh like you stop worrying about it and just kind of brushing off what he's saying and that's disrespectful because he still says you don't listen to me and he just said it actually a couple weeks ago he said you don't listen to me and I thought I am listening I'm listening but this was a big thing to realize like I haven't been listening and and in a way kind of feeling like I'm better I'm 
because I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. But then I look at him and say, but you might be, or she might be, and, and they're doing the exact same thing. But I ended up taking the guy off my Facebook and, you know, all that stuff, because I just thought like, oh my God, my poor husband. Um, you know, I, I, I really just stomped on him. And that hurts. It hurts to think about that. Um, sorry, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's riveting. I mean, your accountability is just beautiful. I just want to hug you. And I relate <laughs> to you so much, Juliana. So this is, this is amazing. Your, your courage is just something else, right? Because it is not easy to realize like, oh, I haven't been listening. Like that's a painful moment. Yeah. And but, it, but it's freedom too. Yeah. And I think that's the part is it goes back to self-care because before when he would tell me something, I immediately would take it as an attack. And I would think like, ah, and my walls would go up. And especially when he left, I thought, here we go again. Here we go again. Same old thing. He's just like my ex. You know, my ex hasn't seen his kids in like seven, eight years. Um, and then I thought, this is, no, he's not just like my ex. This is a good man. There's something I'm doing. And the self-care allowed me to hear what he's saying behind that, behind, you know, when he says, you don't listen. And, and really hearing that I'm putting him down. I'm thinking I'm better than him by not listening to him. That I'm disregarding him and it's so disrespectful when you really stop and think about what that means and and instead of immediately just oh getting hurt stop for a minute and think this man this man loves me more than anybody on this planet anybody and he's not trying to hurt me and if and I promise if women just really stopped and they asked their husband, are you trying to hurt me? He would say no, because that's not what he's trying to do. He wants us to be our best selves. And we're a reflection of him. And that's the thing is he, everything he's been telling me is because he wants me to be my best self. And he loves me. He's not trying to hurt me. And isn't that a great feeling to know that he loves you more than anybody else in the whole world? Like, isn't that such a precious yeah. thing to live yeah. with every day? Yeah. Yeah. And it almost, it almost went away. You almost lost that. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. Now, and now it's here. Yeah. And now you're, <laughs> you're back. Like, and yeah, it's, I think realizing, um, you know, when he's not doing well, you know, he's at his lowest. I'm not leaving him. I promised him I'd be here until the day I died. I promised to love him until the day I died. And these skills have made that dream become a reality. Like I'm able to use these tools to be able to choose him every single day. And that for me was the hugest blessing because. I knew I wanted to be married to him, but I just didn't know how to make that possible. Like, how am I going to do this? And if any woman's thinking like, my husband's not, my husband's not, just know that this, because he's going through something is not his end. That's not his end. It's just a part of the journey. And just like you discover the skills, he is smart. He's going to figure it out, but he's going to figure it out when he sees you, when he sees that un conditional love there there's no boundaries to it there's no conditions and that's what you're showing him that's different uh, because the world there's so many conditions on what makes you lovable and what you need to leave if, if respect's not being served and blah, blah blah all these other nonsense and so you know part of my self-care is shutting off a lot of the social media because it's just trash and it doesn't feed your soul and that was big because I want to be able to love him. And it just comes full circle because the more you do it, he's going to start reflecting that back to you. So it's only, it really is only to your benefit to do the skills. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes any sense. But, yeah. Yes. They're, they're 
selfish in a way, like in a good way, right? They they yeah. give you what you want. Yeah. They really just want to make us happy. And yeah. that's what he's every day. He's he bought me like a weighted blanket. He knew I wasn't sleeping, so he bought me a weighted blanket and he was like, I heard these are good. And like every day coming home with something from work and he gets home at like eleven o'clock at night. And I just wait up for him, even though I have to be up like at five o'clock in the morning, but I wait up because I was so excited to see him. Um, which is probably not a good thing because it is digging into my self care for sleep. <laughs> but I, I love I notice he just loves being around me and mm-hmm. I, I love that. And this is what I've been wanting is something is how can I love this man the way he needs to be loved? And I think that's what every man is searching for is for that love that that's going to show them that, that transforms them into their best selves. And that's what these skills have done. And I'm seeing him in a different way, even from when we first met, it's just, this is him. Like he's, he's my hero. He's, he really is the most amazing man to me. And the reward is he feels so thoroughly loved by him. Yeah. Sounds like, yeah. Yeah. and that's, and that's what you prayed for. That's what I prayed for. And I, I prayed for that. And I said, I will wait for that. And God answered my prayers. And yeah, it's, I think, every woman and I, I tell him too I said I wish every woman had a husband like you <laughs> but I I still feel like the luckiest woman alive I think. what would you say to a woman who's maybe she's separated her husband's left and she thinks he's never coming back and what's your tip for her because you've created something amazing um where should she start? What should she do? I think that really having humility, um, it really, it really stop and say, what is my part in this? Um, instead of saying I'm doing this or that, and they're not trying, or they already gave up, um, look at it from the point that they're at their lowest and they've reached their breaking point. And then that's when you can say, you know, what what can I do to make this better? And maybe, maybe the way that they're responding is something that I'm doing. What is my part in this? Um, a lot of women, including myself, I would look and say, well, he's doing this, he's doing that as this, as if what he was doing was worse than what I'm doing. And I think that has to go away that that whole measuring the vice is measuring it and saying well you're what you're doing is worse and so I'm not doing something as bad but just that disrespect that disrespect not calling him um having that tone having that face you know withholding love um you know there's so much things um leaving without telling him where you're going um you know, talking to other guys or flirting with other guys. I mean, I'm not saying that's what all women are doing, but I'm just saying, um, you know, anything that's disrespectful, if you're doing certain things, that's just as bad. It's just as bad. And even if he, some were like, well, he, you know, he left or he's talking to someone else, he's searching for that love. And what they need to remember is he chose you. He chose me when he married me. And my husband is not, I mean, my husband, and I'm not just saying this because I'm his wife, but he really is like the most handsome man alive. I I, <laughs> I, I really think he's just hot. So I know he has no problem getting a woman, but being humble enough to say, you know what? He chose me. He chose me. He could have had any other woman and he chose me. You're special. Yeah. Yeah. So realizing, look at yourself and, and look at how can I love this man the way he needs to be loved? And whether he deserves it or not, how can I love him mm. the way he needs to be loved? The way that this man who sacrificed, you know, he's already uh, older. He's He was getting ready to retire. He Before he 
we got married, he was going to leave and travel the country for just take a year off work and go <laughs> travel. And his kids are grown. And he came back to take care of my kids who immediately rebelled and have caused nothing but chaos. And he still decided to stick around for that. He chose that. That says a lot. Yeah, so yeah. To, to disregard, look at the evidence, look at the evidence and, and focus on the evidence and really praise that. I mean, spouse fulfilling prophecies. I can't even stress that enough. Stop giving oxygen to, to things that are so trivial and don't matter. Because when you speak life into that man, it's, it's, he just becomes this everything to you. I don't even know how to explain it, but that's why I said my husband, he really is my hero. What an amazing story, Juliana. I'm so impressed and inspired and moved by this, what you've done. It's incredible. It's, um, it takes a lot of courage. You, you uh, really ooze humility too. And it's so attractive. I just, no, I, <laughs> you're making a little face as I'm saying that, but <laughs> it's actually, it's very beautiful. Uh, I admire that about you. And I think a lot of people are going to be inspired to hear about what's possible when you choose that humility as you have done and replace a, a separation that seems hopeless with what feels like a, a beautiful, like with you having your hero and getting to feel special and loved and being with the hottest, most intelligent. <laughs> he is. Right? That's what we all, yeah. that's what we all want. <laughs> you know, getting a weighted blanket because he wants to make you happy. And yeah. yeah, there's just so much sweetness. I think one of the things that I'm thinking about as I listen to you is that like love really is all it's cracked up to be. It it's is really worth it. It it is. And um I I married my best friend and we were best friends before I married my best friend and, and I just thought this has to work. This <laughs> but it really is everything that they say it is. Just I, I don't know. I just want to tell women like I was there with you. I was right there with you, and I didn't think this could work. And I thought the same thoughts. But I'm telling you, change. Just look at yourself and really change yourself. Um, and just know that you don't have all the answers. And and actually take joy in knowing that you don't have the answers because now you can learn the right way and do things the right way, and it will turn around. So. Yeah, I don't want to say I know, I know everything, because that means that I'm responsible for the bad stuff. So if I say I don't know, <laughs> now I know the right way, and it goes good. <laughs> Always room to improve, right? It's the yeah. biggest room in the yeah. house is the, the room for improvement. Yeah. 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 Well, great job, and thank you so much for telling your beautiful, courageous story. That's thank been you, a real Laura. gift. Thank you us. for having me on. Thank you to the coaches and thank you to all all of you ladies who um, are working to save your marriage. It's not easy, but just one day at a time. One day at a time. It, it is worth it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Something big is happening on the Laura Doyle campus, and you're invited. Last summer, I hosted a free five-day Adored Wife Challenge, and thousands of women joined to take the practical steps to fix their broken relationships from affairs, abuse, neglect, and abandonment. And even I was amazed at the astounding results they got. We're about to start the Get Respect, Reconnect, and Rev Up Your Love Life in 2021 Challenge on January 4th, where I'll share all my best stuff for free. Register at lauradoyle.org slash challenge now so you don't miss any of the action because this only happens twice a year. Register at lauradoyle.org slash challenge. I'll see you there. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. 
And the advice I find abominable this week comes from a student who had a marriage counselor tell her that, quote, marriage and intimacy are often a U-shaped curve. First of all, a shout out to the student for sending me this lousy advice, which is truly worthy of this award. So thank you for contributing to the podcast. I love that. I'm going to let her explain in her own words why this advice was so vile. She writes, in the bad old days, when I thought my husband was the reason for all of my misery and I was angry or upset a lot, he recommended that I go to counseling. I know, the nerve, right? But I went because I figured it wouldn't hurt to have someone to talk to. And deep inside, I hoped they'd tell me how to get my husband to do what I wanted. And then I could be happy. So naturally, at the second appointment, I brought up my marriage. And after listening and writing some things down, I'll never forget what the counselor said to me. She explained, very matter of fact, that marriage and intimacy are often a U-shaped curve as time goes on. That is, in the beginning, marriages are high on connection and intimacy, but with time and as responsibilities, careers, and families take more energy, they go down. Then, as life slows down after the kids move out or at retirement, they go back up in connection and intimacy. She even got a pen and paper out and drew a U for me. That's all she said. No real advice or action plan, more just a fact that this is just the way life is. This did not sit well for my achiever personality, nor did it explain the high divorce rate or help on the nights I laid in bed crying, wondering how I will make it through these years on the low middle of the magical you. Anyway, you all know how the rest of the story goes. That was my last encounter with the counselor is probably very good at what she does. After all, she never claimed to be a relationship counselor. I was just hoping she would be for me. Feel free to use my experience in your podcast or whenever you speak of the bad advice that we empowered women were once told. I'm so happy. I'm finally figuring out how to make myself happy and how to respect my husband and create the intimacy and connection with the man I always wanted it to be with. My hero my husband. Oh, this is beautifully said. And thank you so much for sending it in to me. I mean, who wants to stay at the bottom of a U-shaped marriage curve? It sounds utterly miserable and lonely. How about if we go for desired and taken care of and adored instead? How about if we don't give up until you get that? That's just how we roll around here. For that reason, the advice that marriage and intimacy are often a U-shaped curve is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about four ways to have deep conversations with your man. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that for Christmas, my sister and brother-in-law got me habanero popcorn that made my face melt off. And I just can't stop eating it. Mm-hmm.